Good afternoon, everybody, to all the participants of this IEA, IIEA uh, webinar. I am so pleased to welcome you to this IIEA webinar, which is co-organized with the Embassy of Colombia in Ireland. I would like to thank both the Embassy and my good friend, Ambassador Cortes, as well as the IIEA for hosting an event on such an important and topical issue addressing gender equality and the global challenge of migration through the prism of the Colombian experience. I have to say Colombia is really at the forefront of these two issues. In terms of gender equality, Colombia has made important strides over the past two decades. And just in the last two years has risen from a ranking of 40th in 2018 to 22nd out of 153 countries in 2020 in the World Economic Forum Global, Global Gender Gap. It has also led the way in its generosity in dealing with migration flows in providing a new home to over 1.8 million Venezuelans who have, were forced to leave their homes. I have no doubt that today's seminar will be incredibly enlightening Colombia has groundbreaking experience to share. As Filippo Grande, UN High Commissioner for Refugees said last year, and I open quotation, Colombia's offer to provide temporary protection to Venezuelans on its territory for a 10 year period is a humanita humanitarian gesture of an unprecedented scale in the region and in the entire world. This initiative is an extraordinary example of humanity, commitment towards human rights and pragmatism. And I close quotes. And I have to share with you all that there is no one better to share Colombia's experience with you than Colombian's Vice President, Martha Lucia Ramirez, who has also shown her generosity in taking some time out of her very busy schedule here in Dublin, where she is attending the Global Diaspora Summit to share Colombia's experience with us today. I personally feel very privileged to be moderating this seminar today, as I have direct experience of working with Her, Her Excellency Martha Lucia. As Ireland's first resident ambassador to Colombia, I received a wonderful welcome from Martha Lucia, but also much inspiration and support. She is a role model and an inspiration to me but much more importantly to millions of Colombian women and girls who now know that it is possible to lead their country and to realize one's dreams of making positive changes in our own country. Finally, before I introduce the Vice President, I wanted to quickly share with you a very personal experience that I had in Colombia. When I look back on my three years in Colombia, I have so many special memories, but one that really sticks with me is when I met a 40-year-old Venez Venezuelan woman in Medellin, a mother of a nine-year-old girl with an inoperable tumor, who prior to having to leave Venezuela had been a business administrator in Venezuela's second city, Maracaibo. She was now selling chewing gum at the traffic lights in Colombia's second city. She was so grateful to her Colombian neighbors who had provided her with refuge with healthcare for her daughter. And when I met her, her, her last remaining wish was that she would be able to recover her career. The temporary protection status and women empowerment programs that the Vice President has led, that Vice President Marta Lucia has led, now means that this woman has this opportunity. This is the extra step that Colombia has taken. And this is what I believe Vice President Ramirez is going to tell us about now. So just to let you know some minimal housekeeping that the Vice President Ramirez will deliver an address of about 20 minutes in length. This will be followed by a Q&A with our audience. And we're so delighted you're here with us. You will be able to join in the discussion using the Q&A function in Zoom, which you should see on your screen just now. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And we will come to them once the Vice President has finished her presentation. Just a reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. And please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the Twitter handle at IIEA. 
I will now formally introduce Vice President Ramirez and then hand over to her. Marta Lucia Ramirez is the first woman to be elected and serve as Deputy Head of State and Government, that is Vice President, in the history of Colombia. In that capacity, she has sought to improve transparency, fight corruption, achieve gender equality, improve infrastructure, and increase economic growth. In May 2021, she was also appointed Minister for Foreign Affairs of Colombia. Previously, she had served as Minister of Defence from 2002 to 2003, and as the first and only woman to have served as Minister of Defence in Colombia, she created the Armed Forces School of Human Rights and sought to promote women in service by allowing them to reach the rank of general for the first time in Colombian history. So it's often said of us women that we manage many different roles at the same time, but I don't think there's none, there's anyone who manages as many different roles as our today's speaker. Vice President Ramirez, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, our friend, uh, Alison Milton. She was a great ambassador uh, from uh, Ireland in Colombia. And I would like to thank also uh, our ambassador in, uh, in Ireland, uh, Patricia Cortez, the two ambassadors, and of course the current ambassador, which is also a wonderful uh, ambassador, Fiona. Uh, the three of them have been working in order to strengthen the bilateral relation between Ireland and Colombia to share opportunities, but more than that, to work together, identifying new scenarios for this bilateral cooperation in order to strengthen our ties, but also to, uh, to, to, to help uh, different nations to have a better strength of democracies, having a better approach to all these uh, challenges that we are having today. So for me, it's uh, of course a, a great honor to be uh, this afternoon in this event. So I, I thank very much to ambassadors who made it possible. Uh, and for me, it's so important to be part of this kind of discussion about uh, gender equality and migration. Uh, because we have in Colombia, of course, our own perspective, but we also believe that there is a very a different momentum. Now, uh, all the nations in the entire world are very concerned about the future. So many citizens in the entire world are having fear about their future. It's a lot of uncertainty. The pandemic is still there, it's not finished. And now we have not only the challenge to recover from COVID, from COVID but we also have uh, this so uh, sad and unfair uh, war from uh, Russia against Ukraine. And we also have a lot of challenges about uh, climate change. In many nations during the uh, COVID uh, lockdown uh, went back in terms of poverty and extreme poverty. Colombia is one of that countries. So we have the challenge to move forward again to reduce poverty, to eliminate extreme poverty, to uh, handle with the DGS the, 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 the for year 2030, and also to uh, try to, 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 to bring better opportunities, economic opportunities through job creation for uh, our citizens. So in that scenario, I believe this is a very unique opportunity to make everybody reflect about the importance of gender equality, not only as a moral or ethical uh, discussion, it's because we all uh, have the need to include women in different aspects uh, of lives in, in, in all nations in the world. First of all, let me say that for the entire history of humanity, women have been a part of economic power and also political power. And we are completely convinced in Colombia that if we include women in the economic power, and if we include women in political power, for sure, we will improve conditions of life for everybody. If we include women in economic power, we can uh, try to have, uh, I don't know if uh, to, to double the GDP growth, but at least I'm convinced that we are going to have a very important a increase in the GDP growth if we include all the women and opportunities and possibilities to be part of the global economy. And it's the same with politics. Women in the leadership roles in politics means 
This is this commitment with the public service, this commitment with the states, which are going to be more uh, efficient and transparent. And what we need is to have efficiency and transparency in order to have more legitimacy from states for, for, for the, our citizens. So for me, it's clear that we have this opportunity to think about the gender issues in a different approach than before. For many years, all the discussions from gender have been around violence against women. Of course, it exists violence against women. But if we have women with more economic autonomy, if we have women uh, participating not only in the jobs creation, but also as business, business women in the entire world, these women will be uh, more prepared to uh, confront and to avoid any kind of violence against them. So we are uh, convinced that women play this uh, pivotal role in societies. Uh, and of course, uh, be excluding from these positions of uh, political power and economic power, but it's clear is that the nations and the entire society has been losing this enormous potential to make the world a, a, a better world, to make a more inclusive and more innovative, more prosperous and a better adapted a world to the many challenges that we uh, are facing uh, now. So the cause of women for me is a fascinating cause. It's a fascinating cause because through women, we can have an impact in children, in families, in the entire society. So that's why uh, for us, uh, it is clear that uh, during these uh, three years, we have this opportunity because when people say, oh, you are the first women elected as vice president, I said, yes, but this is not a reason to feel uh, proud or to say, okay, it's because I am very capable and I was fighting. Yes, I have been fighting my entire life and my entire career. But what is it, uh, clear for me is being the first woman as vice president means to have the highest responsibility to work hard in order to change conditions of life for women and through women for many people in uh, our society. So that's why uh, when we arrived to government, I asked President Duque, I would like to bring uh, gender equality to the vice presidency. I have been involved in so many different issues in the economic growth, in a competitiveness of Colombia. In my past life, I used to be a foreign trade minister. So that's the reason why I have been very close to the business community in Colombia, but I also brought this responsibility to work in gender gender equality. And we have in Colombia a presidential uh, advisor's office in order to work in gender equality. So through this office, we have been uh, working for the last uh, three years in order to develop uh, at least uh, five uh, areas. Uh, we believe that the first area must, must be, of course, the uh, economic autonomy for women. We believe that uh, if women uh, are going to be in uh, decision-making processes in the uh, business community, if we can have more women involved in the economy, both at the national level and also in the local level, we will have a better economic growth in our country. And we believe that uh, the, the economic and social strategies must include uh, these uh, affirmative public policies to privilege uh, the women's participation in the labor force and also in the public uh, spheres with more opportunities, more entrepreneurship, more leadership positions, and of course, with less uh, digital uh, reach. In these uh, three years and a half, uh, our country's objective has been to empower 23.3 million women. So we are clear that 50% of the Colombian citizens must be empowered. There are so many capable women, there are so many who knows uh, the power that they have, but we need to move uh, women in Colombia in order to have this more ambitious agenda, not for us, it's for the country. So women in economy as a first age, it means for us 
that we want to have not only more uh, jobs for women, of course, we want so many jobs for women, but we also would like to have more women entrepreneurs. Colombia has worked uh, so much to consolidate itself as a nation of entrepreneurial women. We have supported more than 840,000 women, rural, uh, rural and urban entrepreneurs with different government instruments uh, to continue consolidating their businesses with a market vision and to make them profitable, scalable, and sustainable. We create uh, different uh, instruments. And I would like to insist in the scalable business because uh, I don't know why, but people uh, think that, okay, a, a, a entrepreneurship for women are small things. You can do something very easy and this is gonna be an entrepreneurship for women. And that's not truth. Women can be the owners of large scale uh, companies, not only to produce for the uh, countries, but also to export goods, to export uh, services. So that's why uh, we create these uh, three uh, legal instruments. The first of all is a found, which is called Mujer Emprende, Women Entrepreneur Found. And this is aimed at financing the expansion of rural and urban uh, women business initiatives with resources uh, for more than five, uh, that, uh, 15, uh, hundred, uh, no, 15 uh, million US uh, dollars. And this is uh, just starting of course, so this is not a big uh, amount of money. This is another characteristic. Budget for women is always a very small budget. And this is a, um, a convention I have, if a, a presidents and prime ministers and governments wants to show themselves like a very proactive for women, the first condition that we have to ask them is, okay, I would like to see your budget for women equality. So uh, this is the case in Colombia, so many other places, the budget is still a small budget, but at least we have this a budget for this a project for women, hopefully in the future, I hope we can have um, not only uh, this budget for provide loans for women, but also to have equity in women uh, firms. So uh, that's uh, the reason why we think that uh, with this process, uh, we will set the foundation for women economic empowerment for years to come. The second tool has been the gender responsive public uh, procurement measures. This is uh, the grand differential criteria and additional points uh, for women companies. Of course, we are working under the basis that when you are uh, taking the decision for government procurement, you have to look for the best uh, choice, the best uh, quality product, the best quality service, the best prices, the best conditions, of course. So they have to be uh, projects which are, <clears throat> excuse me, competitive in terms of market, but if uh, there are uh, two uh, offers very similar, very alike, uh, we are going to give some additional points to the women companies in order to have this uh, gender uh, criteria to promote uh, the women companies. And the third instrument has been the women uh, royalties type project, because in Colombia, as you know, for the oil production, mining production, whatever, we have uh, royalties that companies pay. And in the past, they were used only in roads and different uh, issues. Now we are promoting that part of these royalties will be used in science, technology, and innovation. And of course, part of this it will be used in a com a companies owned by women. So these uh, royalties, and now we have a kind of um, laboratory uh, with so many different uh, majors and governors in different uh, states of Colombia. Yeah, and we are structuring projects in order to finance and to have these uh, different uh, women uh, entrepreneurs uh, to accelerate this economic reactivation uh, for their departments also. So in addition, recognizing that the unique distribution of unpaid work affects uh, women mostly, Colombia for more than 10 years has been measuring the contribution of women through care, which reaches 20% of today's uh, Colombian GDP. So together with the financial system, we achieved the recognition of the care work hours 
in a kind of credit scoring and pass the parental leave law that promotes the equitable sharing of care work. Likewise, resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, we carried out a gender responsive fiscal reform. And let me say, I don't know any other country that have a fiscal reform during the pandemic. And uh, I have no uh, information and no evidence that there is another country with a fiscal reform with this gender focus, gender responsive. So during the confinement, 50% uh, were reimbursed for women's jobs and one third of women's formal employment was retained to these uh, different measures in the, in the fiscal reform uh, to generate new jobs. Uh, we also uh, help with the payroll subsidies. So we uh, established a 25% uh, subsidy for the payroll of young women uh, and men. This is 25% for the youth, but uh, we have the focus in women older than uh, five, uh, that 25 uh, years, they are going to have an additional 15% of a subsidy for the creation of new jobs when they are uh, for women. So as a result, today, the women in Colombia have been leaving the recovery of the employment with a 57.6% of the total new jobs in our country. And in addition to close the gender labor gap, a presidential directive, uh, we, uh, we had a, a presidential directive, a year a year and a half ago with the same gender approach for this economic reactivation. So this measure boosts the hiring of women in sectors like construction, infrastructure, mining, energy, uh, of course, uh, in, uh, sectors like health, uh, tourism now, because we have opened all the tourism uh, and that kind of services, restaurants, whatever. So. Now we are promoting these um, STEAM fields of work aimed at girls and adolescents training young women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And finally, of course, the digital literacy for women of all ages. For us, education is a, a paramount. So this is the first area. The second one is more women in politics. The second policy of our equity policy is to involve women in these uh, leadership uh, or in these roles for, for politics. And we achieved the approval uh, in a, of a reform in the electoral code in Colombia. Uh, it was uh, four months ago, but we were fighting so hard. And finally, we have a very positive result to have a parity list in the electoral code. So uh, this reform will be uh, in place for the next election. Unfortunately, there is a now in the constitutional court. So that's the reason why it was not ready for the election that we have had only two weeks ago. But the next Colombian uh, Congress election will have 50% uh, of women in the list of all the political parties. Of course, the challenge now is that these women become elected women. And it means that we have to work so hard with the political parties in order to be sure that they are going to have the financing for their campaigns, that they are going to have a open room for different debates and whatever. But this uh, was an important uh, reform in this electoral court, uh, code. And we also have been working so much in the last uh, two years and a half in a national school of political a training. I asked one well, Colombian university and also the Hans Seidel Foundation, this is a foundation from Germany, to help us to train women. And we have trained 5,000 women through uh, the country. Uh, so for us, it's so uh, positive to tell you that we have a, an election uh, last uh, March 13. And in that election, the congressional election showed a substantial progress in terms of women representation because we occupied 80 of 267 seats at the Congress, which represents 30% of participation. Let me say that before this election, 
women were only with 19% of participation. So now we have 30% in the next election, for sure, we have to look for this 45, 50% of participation for women in Congress. The third area uh, that we have been working is women, peace and security. You have uh, in Ireland all this experience about a peace process, uh, security issues. Uh, for us in Colombia, uh, Ireland is the role model to, to, to follow in terms of uh, the, 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 the work for, for peace in order to achieve peace uh, for our countries. So we highlight that 57% of the indicators that were uh, defined for the implementation of the agreement between FARC and the Colombian government in the previous government. Uh, these indicators uh, have been with this uh, framework of gender. And for us, it's uh, very uh, positive also to say that so many of them, more than 50%, uh, more than uh, we have had an important improvement. So in the last four years, women participation uh, in this uh, process uh, as a leaders in social areas of Colombia or whatever has been also increasing and they are uh, women following the implementation of the peace um, agreement. And also in the last four years, the women participation in the public, uh, Colombian public force has grown by 38%. Let me say that as Alison has mentioned, I was a defense minister in Colombia in year 2002. It was a very difficult time because on that moment we had this very uh, difficult and very hard uh, internal conflict. And on that time when I was appointed minister of defense, uh, I was informed that women were allowed to be in their forces only uh, to the level of coronels. When they uh, arrived to coronels, they have to stay for at maximum two years and they, they have to resign. They have to leave uh, their military careers. And I said, there's no way I cannot be the defense minister if I know that there are women who are capable, who have the, uh, the, the patient, who have the uh, commitment with the security issues and they are not able to compete in order to run for generals. So that's something that I ask to let them to compete. If they uh, win positions, fine. If they don't, okay, they have to leave. And it was wonderful because three years uh, later, we have had the first women as a general. It was in the police. At the beginning, it was in the police. But now we have women generals in the army and the police. And what it's most important is that they are not only in the administrative matters or um, health matters or um, uh, financial matters. Now they are in the uh, in the line of command. Now they are in operations. Now they are uh, working as a real officers in the armed forces and in the police. And this is something that uh, will be uh, so important with this increasing in the participation of women in the in, in the public force. So uh, we, uh, to achieve the, this goal, we have some guidelines to promotion of equity in the prevention of violence against women in the military and police spheres. Uh, and this is something that, let me say, we have been working not only in the second or third level, we have been working in the first level with the general commander of the armed forces, the general director of the national uh, police, because we believe that this is uh, something which is substantial for the uh, legitimacy and the strength of these institutions for the Colombian security. The fourth area have been women free of violence. At the beginning, I said, uh, usually it was the speech for women. Uh, women are suffering violence. Yes, we still have women suffering violence. You still have uh, women suffering violence. The entire world. So during the lockdown, how much the domestic violence has increased, so many cases of uh, women suffering violence. So of course, this is an axis that we still have to uh, work in and to be uh, enough uh, clear that there are uh, so many challenges. 
Uh, what is uh, something uh, important also is that 76% of the municipalities in Colombia and all the 32 departments that we have now, they have a mechanism that we create to prevent, confront, and to solve and punish violence against women. Let me say, during our government, for the first time in the Colombian history, uh, the president of Colombia, he organized these um, security meetings uh, focused only in security for women. So security meetings at the national level with the commanders of the uh, public forces, the director of the police, but also with representatives of the judiciary, uh, judges. Um, we have in Colombia something which is called um, Comisaria de Familia, uh, family uh, commissioners, uh, and the, those are an institutions that have um, uh, some legal capacities to have an intervention uh, uh, asking for the uh, judicial system uh, prosecution in cases that uh, there are evidences about uh, family uh, about a uh, uh, family uh, violence. So through all this, we have this first national meeting to be focused in security for women. And after that, now we have in all the departments, these uh, meetings which are regularly in order to be clear that we have enough uh, policies to uh, avoid, to prevent uh, violence uh, against women. And we also create a new uh, figure which is called Ines. Ines in Spanish is a women name. And I put this name because we have this interinstitutional nation economic empowerment and security for women. This is the meaning of INES. So this is a strategy to bring justice to doorstep for rural women. So if somebody has any information that women in very apart villages are suffering uh, violence, uh, the the uh, family uh, commissioners and also a judge and a police will be there on their own house to ask what's happening and of course to protect these women or their children. So through this strategy, we have visited more than 2,000 homes in, the, in 18 departments in the last year and a half. And we are working every single day, raising awareness about this violence, what it means, and the action routes to address it. This strategy was recognized as a, a, an innovative gender policy by United Nations uh, women. The six uh, uh, axial of our work uh, have been uh, in the institutionality uh, for women. So for the first time, we also have in the Colombian National Development uh, Plan, a chapter which is focused in gender equality. So when you have this at the national level, you also have the, um, the moral capacity to ask your governors and your mayors that they have to do uh, the same. So for the first time, all the Colombian departments, which are 32, as I mentioned before, they include a gender equi equity chapter under uh, development plans. And they have been creating some kind of gender secretariats for women uh, in some of the departments. It means secretariats without bureaucracy because I asked them, okay, you can put uh, one or two or three members from your uh, health secretariat, from your political secretariat, from some others, in order to have this secretariat to uh, be uh, offering women in every single department, all the national all the uh, national institutions offer, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, for women uh, in, in, in our government. So through this uh, strength of institutions for women, we are also uh, uh, having this very positive reaction because this inclusion is now a reality, uh, they are uh, creating some of the um, departments and whatever. They also creating with us a, an, a monitor uh, to be clear that uh, 
all these um, governors and also mayors are allocating some budget and programs to close the gender gaps. So to date, we have uh, created 25 empowered uh, women houses, and we are giving them uh, training in uh, technology. We are giving them training to organize their own uh, firms to become entrepreneurs. We are giving them a financial training. We are giving them um, a low um, council. Uh, okay. Uh, and we are also giving them some uh, psychological assistance because when women ha are having a uh, violence, of course, uh, they also need this kind of uh, psychological assistance. So we have these 25 empower women, a thousand, and until now, it, they were created in the last two years. Until now, we have had 117,000 women who have benefited from this legal uh, counseling and advice, the financial uh, training, uh, whatever. So this is something which is also uh, changing very much. So through our axis of equity and policy, Colombia's reaffirming uh, our commitment to increase the fully equal and meaningful participation of women in all the decision-making processes and positions. And of course, migration. Migration for us is a key challenge because as you know, we have uh, 2 million Venezuelans in Colombia. You know that Venezuela has 6.3 million migrants because there is a dictatorship in Venezuela, a very hard and horrible dictatorship affecting uh, human rights of, uh, and everything. So these 6.3 million are uh, very difficult to, to assume, but we uh, in Colombia, we took 30%. So we have in Colombia 2 million Venezuelans uh, in this migration policy that uh, President Duque has been leading. It's a temporary protection status. And we also have this importance of adopting a gender approach to the migration policy, emphasizing the particular impacts of migration on women, these essential requirements and benefits of a gender-based approach to understand and to address, of course, the complex migration flows and to protect also, because there are so many cases in different countries with these um, uh, mafias of human trafficking or uh, uh, migrants trafficking. So we have been also working in order to protect women. And uh, Alison's uh, experience is a, a very sad one. And I have heard so many very similar. And I agree with you. This is something which is shocking. And this is something that gives you more strength in order to work to protect all of them. So I will then discuss Colombia's experience, achievements, and challenges through the adoption of a comprehensive migration policy and this temporary protection status for the Venezuelan migrants, which have been uh, widely recognized as an example of fraternity and solidarity and responsibility with um, a broader uh, country like uh, Venezuela is for, for Colombia. So migration is a very complex process in different societies, cultures, territories. Now you have the Ukrainian migration. It's gonna be very complex uh, for Europe because at the beginning you can think, okay, this is gonna be for one year, two years. This is gonna be a short time. This is not realistic. This is gonna be for a long time. And this is gonna be a lot of people. It's going to involve a lot, millions of uh, Ukrainians and you have to prepare yourselves in order to um, include these people for re real inclusion in the, in the society. And we have to be very clear about these specific characteristics that uh, determine uh, both their access to benefits, the risk involved in the migration process, the differentiated impacts for men and women, of course. Uh, and as such, uh, migration should be understood as a gender process. So comprising almost half of the world's total population of migrants, migrant women are agents of change and leaders who contribute socially and economically in multiple ways to their countries of origin and might also contribute in the same manner to the receiving or adopting countries through their skills and knowledge, as well as by sending remittances to their relatives and friends, thus helping to improve 
the living standards. Yesterday, in this wonderful uh, forum that the island government and also the um, uh, International Migration Office from the United Nations organized here in Dublin, I mentioned so many years we have heard about migrants in terms of remittances. This is not an issue of remittances. So many migrants are, are not capable to remit money to their uh, countries, but they are capable for sure to uh, be a part of the labor force, to be part of the economic uh, growth, to be part of the new jobs uh, creation. So this is, could be something in benefit of uh, both um, uh, sides. So um, despite all these contributions that migrant women suffer from uh, intersecting forms of discrimination, encountering additional challenges, such as the feminization of poverty, the, the deepening of all types of violence and reduced opportunity frameworks. Migrant women are more frequently affected by socioeconomic challenges, such as unemployment, underemployment, informal uh, employment, such as this, uh, and their significant participation in this unpaid domestic work and market labor is not always fully taken into account, but uh, neither a gender-based approach for the specific experiences relating to women are usually captured in migration laws, programs, or data collecting system. The states frequently forget to address this uh, massive crisis with gender lenses and overlook the importance of understanding whether migration occurs because of gender inequality or it itself helps to perpetuate uh, so many gender disparities. So in our view, to achieve an effective migration governance, states must assess the specific challenges that affect migrant women and girls with particular emphasis uh, in these uh, discriminatory practices influencing the decision-making and the ability uh, to uh, migrate. Uh, but more importantly, states need to be focused on how to empower women and girls through uh, the migration policies. So Colombia's migratory reality has changed uh, considerably during the last uh, three or four years, going from a country mainly sending migrants to a country receiving a, a, large, a large migration flows. And now, as I said, 2 million uh, from Venezuela. And we are 50 million people in Colombia. So you can see we have uh, 2 million. It has a big impact for the Colombian uh, economy. And 52% of these migrants in Colombia are uh, women. And they immigrate for different reasons to look for better opportunities, look for work, uh, for health services, for uh, political uh, discrimination or for political risk in Venezuela, just to mention some. So this massive uh, migration process on um, February 8th of uh, 2021 was launched by President uh, Colombia, de Colombia and also Filippo Grandi from United Nations. And they launched this uh, temporary protection status for the Venezuelan migrants. And we feel that this is going to be a, a good reference, a good, uh, not role model, but a good reference to uh, uh, take in consideration for this uh, new um, uh, European uh, challenge through the Ukrainians and also the, the Syrians uh, who are still uh, here. So Colombia recognizes the risks, the challenges, the vulnerabilities, but we would like to say we are ready to work in order to change this uh, in our country and to help to change this in different countries and regions uh, in the world. So thank you very much to the two ambassadors for this uh, opportunity to, to share with uh, all of you. And I'm ready, Alison, if you want to, to arise some questions. So thank you very much. Thank and you of so course, much. I'm so sorry. And of course, I would like to, to thank again to Andrew Gilmore from the Institute for International and European Affairs, because this is a wonderful think tank. And so for me, it's a honor to be invited here. Thank you very much.